Pod Techler episode 316, Forda to Don episode 1 for October 5th, 2012. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Podtacular, the unofficial Halo Universe podcast. I'm your host, Dust Storm. I'm your co-host, Daphne. And I'm your other host, Brent Gamer. And today we're doing a quick short special on the Ford Unto Dawn machinima that came out. Well, it's not really a machinima. It's... But came out of machinima. It's a live it's, action. Yeah, it's a live action, but came out of machinima. So for some reason, I still like to call it machinima for some random reason. But we have the first episode of Ford Unto Dawn out today. It was released really early this morning on Waypoint and Machinima Prime. So we're going to take a little time to kind of go through the episode kind of scene by scene and kind of talk about what we think about Ford Unto Dawn. So before we get into that, what are your guys' overall first impressions of Ford Unto Dawn? Do you think it's going to be a good series? Are you really looking forward to kind of seeing a different side of Halo? What, what are your initial thoughts for For Them to Dawn? Pretty good. Uh, yeah, going in, I wasn't really sure what to expect. It was going to focus more on, like, combat scenarios or drama. And, I mean, there was a, a little bit of combat footage going on uh, during the, the training exercise, but there's a good bit of drama, too, so. I love the I'm combat glad. part at the beginning was kind of a blur. You know what I mean? It wasn't. I don't, I don't think they flesh it out, you know. It seemed like it was could. kind of setting the stage for how we're going to see Lasky evolve as a character in Fort and the Dawn. Yeah. It's right. basically, well, it was just him, like, running through the woods, you know, with bullets whizzing past him. Like, I, I, there wasn't, I, I don't know if it's even combat. Like, it's more just kind of like an, an Well, it's, it's a training drill is what it was. Yeah. I know, but... So what was basically going on was they're doing training for fighting off an insurrectionist, and... Lasky didn't follow orders and caused his team a, a grave mistake. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But I think for the most part, this episode was more of laying the groundwork for developing Lasky as a character for Fortnite to Dawn. Yeah, like, here's your main character. Mm-hmm. Here's his problem. So expect this to be resolved by the end of the miniseries. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I thought... See, I, I think... A lot of people kind of have the feeling of like, so you know, Halo live action thing with with some fleshed out characters, some drama to it. Like this could either be good or this could be like really bad. You know what I mean? Like bad. Like <laughs> I I think you know they did a pretty good job. Uh, the special effects were really you know good and costumes were crisp and acting was pretty spot on. Let's go into this scene by scene now. First thing we have is the Forge of the Dawn. And it's broken up form, just kind of drifting out in the middle of space. And then long off on some other uh, system somewhere. We don't know if it's if they're at Earth or if they're somewhere else in the Milky Way. But Commander Lasky gets this distress beacon from Cortana and forward him to Don with the Mayday message that there's one surviving member on board. So he's received that message and he's trying to make a decision of whether or not to go and get the chief and then it flashes back to the time that we opened up Fort Under Dawn pretty much with. Mm -hmm. For those for those of you who are kind of attentive to the news you'll know that Master Chief is going to play a part in Fort Under Dawn, so it's pretty much gonna flash back to this time where Lasky encounters Chief for the first time and Look, he's my hero. For the most part, yeah. He's probably going through through his mind of the stuff that happened between him and Chief back on Circinius 4, which is where this uh, cadet training camp is. Uh, moving on from that, we our f- first scene that we have actually what I consider part of the series, other than the distress signal, is every, every one of the cadets for this... Astani team, or I'm not sure exactly how that is spelled, but it sounds like Astani. 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 All right. I tried to do a search for that, quick search, and I couldn't quite find it, but your searching skills are obviously better than mine. But... Well, I've pulled up the Halopedia 
forward onto Don page just to make sure I had all these characters in okay. front of me. Uh, but Hastati team is pretty much dropping out of cryo, doing basically hot drop scenario, and then they're going off against uh, innies. Yeah, some good vomiting in that scene. Yeah. That was pretty cool. They like I wonder, the, I wonder what they had them do, like the actors just put a bunch of like water in their mouth like <laughs> Probably something like uh I would almost think it would be blended oatmeal. That that's kind of what I would think of was what that looked like. Right. Yeah. Uh or milk milk or something. But whenever people get cryo frozen, they pretty much fill you up with nutrients and that stuff pretty much you vomit back out. You're because, supposed to swallow it too. Yeah, you you swallow it. <laughs> yeah, but they, but they all spat, so it, it's well, just they're in cryo training. Yeah. Right. So it's 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 going to be there there's multiple times where people are throwing up. And I'm sure this is not the end to us seeing other people throw up. <laughs> right. It'd be nice if it was, but right. we'll, we'll have to see because there's also another little side plot to it with Lasky getting freezer burns and blisters from the cryo freezing process. So yeah. I think that's going to be a, kind of a subplot to the story of him going through his training and how the freezer burns going to affect him is probably going to affect how his training progresses if it progresses. <laughs> because from what we saw it doesn't look like he's very keen to the idea of following orders and not sharing the vision that the innies are all bad, like everyone else at the Academy does. Yeah, he's a real rebel of his time. Mm. The, speaking of the freezer runs, it kind of made me think of, um, you know, he's lucky he's not a master chief, because I remember in one of the books, it was talking about how, um, you know, the, the burns are bad enough with just regular people, but like master chief, like, because cause he has the armor pressing against him, it, it, it's like amplified by like you know times a hundred or something. It's like he's he's on fire when he gets out of the, the tube, basically. <laughs> but he can like shut his mind off. So, well, it's not shut his mind off. He just ignores. Well, the pain. I mean, distract you know distract himself from the pain. Kind yeah. Of thing. But his soup helps him recover from that a lot quicker than other people as well. Right, right, right. So it it may be a more drastic effect, but they're Spartans; they can handle that kind of stuff. They're big and tough. Right. <laughs> the best of the best. Right? Yeah. So, we see Commander Lasky running through the forest for a training mission with some of his other cadets. And they join up with the rest of Hastani team. And he's given an order to uh, stay back and wait for them to come. But he decides to basically say, screw you, to the team leader. Goes out and gets himself shot. And pretty much loses the game for his team. He uh, lost the game. Uh-huh. Uh, on his way back, uh, they talk a little bit more into the whole freezer burn issue. And then we see kind of our first look at the chain of command at the Academy. And I'm going to play a little clip real quick from Ford to Dawn. Just the audio part. So uh, go ahead and take a quick listen. Let me remind you, cadets, this academy bears the name of the Roman general Gnaeus Domitius Corbulo because he represents honor, valor, allegiance. General Corbulo was to take his own life in the name of the empire. Corbulo did not hesitate nor question. He loyally obeyed, screaming, Axios, as he fell upon his own sword. Axios, I am worthy. But I'm afraid, cadets, today you have proven to be anything but. We are at war with insurrectionists, terrorists, who would like nothing more than to see all of us dead. Had this been a real firefight, the rebels would have likely killed every member of Hastati's squad. Every single one of you at this academy was sent here because your parents are the upper echelon of the United Nations Space Command. Because all of you are its future. And I expect you to act 
like it. So that's the first clip that we get of General Black, and we're probably going to see a lot more of him throughout the rest of the series. A couple of key points I want to pull out of there. So the first one is the word axios, which translates to I am worthy, which was uh, General Corbulo's last words before he committed suicide. Uh, this is a Roman general, uh, Gnaeus Domitius Corbulo. I don't know my Roman history that well, so uh, anyone else that's out there that's a history buff, you may or may not have heard of this person. But the battle cry for this academy is pretty much Axios. And for the most part, the display that Lasky has put on pretty much says that he they don't think that really he really belongs. And you start to see some of the conflict where he's going to be kind of questioning a lot of leadership decisions that are going to be made. Uh, later on, you see that he has some second thoughts about what the insurrectionists or rebels' intentions really are. And if you read the books, you will know that there's a lot of hatred from the rebels that pretty much is is not necessarily one that the general is speaking of. To, they want to exterminate the whole UNSC. They just pretty much want them out of their hands. Uh, these insurrectionists, most of them are pretty much outer colony or inner colony settlers that have gone out and made a living for themselves, and they've pretty much come back and said, well, what's so important about Earth? Because we're here now, we should be important as well, not not just Earth and Earth alone. So you may think that this could be a little bit of brainwashing or not, or maybe that's just what uh, this journal believes. But there's definitely more to it than just that insurrectionists want to kill off the UNSC. Granted, they hate their guts, but it's humanity. We dislike each other for reasons, and the UNSC wants to kind of take a hold of every, everyone and has Earth at the center of everything, so that's where we came from. But they just really want them out of their hair, and it's the UNSC. It, they're, they're not going to kind of just ignore people. So... That's one one of the things I wanted to point out about that little speech. The next thing I wanted to point out was the... <coughs> Sorry. Excuse me. I shouldn't use my mouth. Should have been using my mic. But he pretty much walks up to, to Lasky and he's looking at him pretty much all the time during his speech. There's going to be a lot of conflict between a lot of the leadership at the Academy and... Probably between General Black and last and Cadet Lasky throughout the entire Forward Unto Dawn series, and I think as Lasky kind of starts to mature in his opinion of the insurrectionists and maybe the rest of the leadership at the academy kind of understand how he's looking at things, then there there may be a turning point where these two may become uh, really good friends. But we'll have to see how that turns out uh what are your guys opinions on kind of this relationship between general black and lasky you think it's gonna just be this ongoing drag of they really just dislike each other or do you think that some word down the road is going to kind of turn into something greater than that and maybe possibly even a friendship i think that for the first few episodes it's going to be like lasky and like or General Black's gonna be like, you know, just walking around, always scolding him for the things he does. And I don't think you're gonna see a whole lot of General Black, except in the segments where he's giving lectures or things like that. It doesn't seem like he would be giving a lot of uh, personal advice to the cadets, you know, yeah. talking with them one on one. Yeah, he, but, he, um, he's pretty much the guy that runs the place. Yeah. Um, I'm more interested in the relationship. Between Lasky and Sylvia, Silva, not Silva, the Sullivan, sorry, uh, the other one, or the, uh, above. I, I don't know. Oh. Uh, I'm looking. It was like one of the, the one that called officers. him in. Yes, the instructor, Mahaffey. Colonel Mahaffey. Yeah, yeah, Mahaffey. So that seems like she might have a more interpersonal relationship with. Lasky than General Blackwell. Yeah. 
Well, that's actually the next clip I'm going... Well, it's one of the next clips I'm going to play. But that's going to... Because she even says that she worked under her his mom. Yeah. So there's definitely... It looks like for right now, Colonel Mahaffey is pretty much playing the role of his mother at this academy. And the fact that he's not doing too well kind of worries her. But at the same time, Lasky is almost like saying, I don't care. It's like, whatever, just kick me out. Yeah. <laughs> whatever. Uh, one other thing I wanted to point out about the first clip before we get ahead too far is General Black says that everyone there is descendants of high-ranking UNSC officers. So pretty much they're privileged to be at Corbulo Academy in the first place. Yeah. The fact that Lasky is bringing people down and he's not really living up to his family name is something that a lot of people are not very happy with at the academy and that's kind of where my next clip comes in stop stepping on our dicks lasky hey ease up gingerbread no sully vickers is right my combat scores suck because of you don't bother jj he's gone soft he's an any lover now Dima, that order didn't make any sense doesn't have to make sense just follow it. I'm trying to survive here, okay? You need to respect a chain of command. The UNSC isn't the enemy. The innies are. Spoken like a true believer. Yeah, well, at least I believe in something these days. So in that scene, we really started to get a sense of how everyone else on the squad hates his guts. Everybody hates Lasky. <laughs> so apparently this is not his first rodeo of going off and disobeying direct orders and chain of command. And everyone is kind of griping at the situation. And there's other scenes where the cadets are kind of phoning back home or getting messages from their parents and like they're really looking to them succeeding really well at this academy and the fact that Lasky is going off and doing these daredevilish things that's getting his team into trouble is really not making them best of friends more or less yeah it seems like his only friend is like Sullivan and Silva mhm mm like Sullivan's his only friend like Silva's his love interest but right as far as the other cadets like most of them just hate Lasky. Mm hmm So one of the things that one of the cadets said was just follow orders. And that kind of goes back to the whole story of General Corbulo, where he pretty much was unquestioning and just followed orders. So and that, that's kind of one of the things that General Black touched on in his speech. And it really seems to be one of the facets of their training at the academy. The fact that Lasky does not like to do that is probably going to end up being a big problem for him. We'll have to see, though, when the chief arrives and things drastically change, because things are going to make a big turn during the series. I have a feeling around episode 3 or 4, we're going to see some uh, big changes to the plot line yeah. for Fordham to Dawn. So drastic improvements and, on and, part of Lasky's effort. Yeah, there's there's going to be a huge character development over, I think, the first two or three episodes, and then we're really going to see where Lasky fits in with the rest of the cadets at the Academy and how he will fit into the rest of his UNSC career. Yeah. Uh, next clip I want to play is, of course, um, him with his counselor or his instructor. So I'm going to go ahead and play that one real quick. You don't care. You do realize your helmets transmit everything? No excuse, sir. You continue pulling down your squad, you're going to end up with a lot of enemies. Yes, sir. I served under your mother. I know what she's like. And I sure as hell don't need to tell you that Colonel Lasky's not going to let a son of hers leave this academy without a diploma. I wouldn't know what my mother thinks, sir. I never see her. 
It's been a long war. Your mother holds a lot of hands. So I'm told, sir. You know, Thomas, I've seen a lot of cadets come through here. Many have suffered like you. Pain like that cannot be forgotten, but you can learn how to tolerate it. I'll do my best, sir. That'll be all. So here we see the relationship, as Brent was really interested in, between Colonel Mahaffe and Lasky. And she seems to be one of the only people that's really going to be sympathizing with Lasky. Granted, she doesn't agree with how he's behaving, but with how the relationship between Mahaffe and Lasky's mother is, she probably feels some kind of responsibility to make sure Lasky makes it through without too many bumps or bruises. Yeah. She feels an attachment to him because of her service mm-hmm. underneath Colonel Lasky. So maybe she feels kind of responsible. You know, she doesn't want to yeah. fail the Colonel by, you know, letting uh, Thomas Lasky mm-hmm. mess up. And one of the things that you really see start to dynamic just from a family perspective is the fact that Lasky goes and says that he wouldn't know what his mother expects of him because she's never around. So it's almost like Mahaffe is trying to pick up that role where his mother really wasn't there for him. And seeing this kind of family relationship develop is, I think, what Brent says is going to be one of the interesting relationships to keep a track of. Because between her, uh, Sullivan, and Silva, I think those three are going to be the people that really give Lasky the pushes to make it through the Academy and through the events that are going to come later in the series. Well, what's going to be interesting is to see whether or not Cadman Lasky or uh, Colonel Lasky end up dying at some point during the series and how Thomas is going to take the news. That would be interesting. Because they've already alluded to, to Cadman making his drop mm-hmm. into heavy enemy yeah. territory. He got his ODST, ODST tattoo and everything. So he he has a really strong tie to his brother. Yeah. And I actually have one more clip to play, and it's for that scene. Hey, little bro. Hello from Jericho 7. It's day 131 of deployment. Uh, so I got to show you something. All right, mom's going to flip when she sees this. But whatever. <laughs> it's still a little raw. But we got a big drop on an inning stronghold next week. We want to get it done before then. Anyways. So you haven't been court martialed yet then? I'm not apologizing. Yes, you are. At least I believe in something. I do believe in something. Yeah, so do I. Like what? Just not in stupid orders that lead to needless violence. Negotiating isn't an option anymore, Tom. So we're brainwashing kids and then sending them in to exterminate a bunch of overtaxed farmers. Farmers. That's who you think they are. You have no idea what the innies are like. I have a pretty good idea. Well, then you should know how much they hate us and that they're not going to stop fighting until we're all dead. Can you blame them? Yeah, I can. I blame them for a lot of things. And you should, too. So this is where we get a real glimpse of the struggle that Lasky is going through. So. He believes that the insurrectionists are not necessarily all out to kill the UNSC, which, from what I read from the books, and feel free to chip in on this opinion, guys, is pretty... He's His opinion is pretty much spot on with the insurrectionists. They're tired of UNSC control over just about everything they do. They're not necessarily out to hate the guts of the UNSC, but they just want them out of their hair. And the fact that they're teaching at the academy that the insurrectionists want nothing more than to kill every last person associated with the UNSC is kind of that brainwashing thing that Glasky is kind of alluding to. 
Yeah, I think that in the end it'll probably end up being where it's last saving grace. kind of it, well, no, like somewhere in between. Like he he understands that the rebels like don't want to exterminate everybody in the UNSC and and but they're probably more brutal than he has any idea of. Like the links that they'll go to to achieve their mm-hmm. you know freedom from the UNSC control, like. Because they are a terrorist organization. They use terrorist tactics. They kill civilians. Right. They, you know, they'll do messed up things to achieve their but goals. He, he... And it's probably not as bad as the Academy is... Portraying it. What they said, brainwashing yeah. him and saying... But he's probably going to see that they're more vicious than he, he, he thinks He brings up are. an interesting point, though. Can you blame them? Can you blame them for all the things that we've done to them and all the regulations that the UNSC has put against the insurrectionists yeah. because of the human covenant well, war. It's kind of, it's kind of hard to really pick a side because it honestly kind of reminds me of like the British empire versus like the American, like revolutionists, revolutionaries, whatever. Cause it's like, right. The, yeah. the big, you know, powerful, I mean, we, we weren't out to, you know, we weren't empire. out to kill every last Britain. We just wanted them out of our hair. All right. the regulation that they implied on us over here was something that we were not comfortable with. And I feel that that's pretty much kind of how Lasky feels. Because, like, yeah. ne- neither the instructionists or, you know, I mean, sure, the instructionists, are, you know, they might do some catchy stuff, killing civilians sometimes or whatever. They're not totally evil. They're not totally benevolent. Same with the UNSC. You know, Oni does some pretty sketchy stuff. The Spartan program is a perfect example. The UNSC isn't totally evil, but it's not totally benevolent either. Right. I also want to say that the relationship that Sylvia has with Lasky is going to change. Well, it is going to change throughout the series. But I almost want to say Lasky will probably kind of end up portraying his views about the insurrectionists to Silva. And we'll see a change in Silva's point of view about the insurrectionists as they go through training and Lasky's bound to make more stupid choices like he did in this episode. And a lot more of the cadets are probably going to hate his guts even more, but I think Sylvia is going to be sympathetic with him and possibly even turn to his side of things and understanding what the insurrectionists really feel. And Lasky may have some history with the insurrectionists that we don't know of yet that will be revealed later throughout the series, but my guess is that he's probably been with insurrectionists at some point and has an idea of why the rebels are doing what they're doing and what their true intentions are, which it is pretty much, they just want the UNSC out of their hair. Uh, so that's all the clips I had. Uh, a couple of things that really can't do in uh, sound bit form, but there's some pictures up there. Uh, there's a nice little article that goes through the ending sequences of Forward Into Dawn for this first episode on HaloFanForLife.com. First one is the stone placard that's above the beds. And there's a bit of text that reads, and I'm going to read it real quick. It says, Through knowledge, victory, through unity, peace, honor, valor, allegiance, Today, tomorrow, forever, together we rise, together we prevail. Forward unto dawn, for earth, for earth. Honor, valor, allegiance, excellence. Today, tomorrow, forever. We, together we rise, together we prevail. And it just keeps on going and going and going. So that's something that's over the beds of every cadet, pretty much. And it seems that, I, I don't know what this text really comes from but it's probably the motto for the Academy, I would think. Yeah. So through knowledge, victory, unity, peace, honor, valor, allegiance, pretty much all respectable traits that you would have for a soldier in the Marine Corps. Uh, to <clears throat> today, tomorrow, forever, pretty much went throughout the whole time that you're in the Marines, which is you never really leave. Uh, with Together we rise, together we prevail. Pretty much you are a team. You act as a team. You follow the direct the orders of people above you. <laughs> uh, forward unto dawn from earth, 
for Earth. So basically that's saying Earth is where we came from. We fight for Earth and for her colonies. That's pretty much the breakdown of, I think, the four core aspects of what the UNSC would pretty much be. Does that sound right to you guys? Yeah. So that that's above the beds. Uh, thanks to the guys at Halo Fan for Life for uh, doing the free f- freeze frame and doing the analysis on that. Last thing is the last scene that we have is uh, a pan up from the floor of Lasky's room up to the window, and we see this flash of Covenant text and then the interface of the computer that's there in front of the window gets brought up for a split second, goes away, and then off in the sky we see this streak of purple light somewhere. And it looks like it comes in, then turns around, and then hovers in the sky. So, that... Yeah, well, watch out for the color I, purple. I want to say that's you know. something Covenant. Probably a Covenant yep. spy of some kind. Aliens. I mean, we're in the middle of the Human Covenant War, and Ford and Dawn is basically the story of the first time the Academy gets hit with Covenant, and then Chief is deployed there pretty much to kind of help fight the Covenant off. So that, that last scene, I'm pretty sure it's Covenant, because the color purple... I mean, who else has the color purple, right? Prince. Uh. <laughs> the artist formerly known as Prince. Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> it's Prince flying in. Wow. That, that would actually that be would, funny to me. That would be... He's got, he's got, he's got that the gender symbol, the, the male and female combined or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> he, like, breaks down. Let's get crazy! Oh, goodness. And, like, starts playing, like, they have to shoot him in the head. That's just the end of the insurrection. Yeah. That's, that's... <laughs> Prince is an insurrectionist. <laughs> Wow! What a, what a twist! Uh, another quick thing. I always felt like he was like a wannabe Michael Jackson. You know what I mean. Another quick <laughs> thing is kind of the complex layout of Core Blue Academy. There's lots of satellite dishes, which is it. It almost makes you think that's almost a center for gathering information. Like the academy is just one of the yeah. things that is there. Not a, not at all. We go go look at standoff. So there's tons of satellites. Well, on they're the off in the distance, right? And the map description says they contain the prepared response. Their missiles. So there's two. There's so many satellites here, though, which makes me, which makes which me believe a little bit a more than the academy is going on. Well, how else are they going to get direct TV? <laughs> Well, there there is a space elevator there, so maybe it's just coordinating comms with incoming ships and everything else. But the fact that it's in the, the academy is a giant complex with a lot of additional satellites, and the space elevator probably is an indication that there's more there than just the academy. Yeah, secret Oni base yeah. underneath and the academy. And there's little hints of. Oni stuff going on throughout it as well. They're they're very minuscule, so we didn't really touch on them. But there's probably going to be more scenes relating to Oni throughout the rest of the series. So, what if it turns out that Lasky is really an undercover? I Oni doubt agent? it. I seriously no. doubt it. It would be that would just no. That would not make sense. What a twist! <laughs> he, he's too. Naive, yeah, no, that too. To, but what if he's acting that way? Yeah, right. Pull out which the, which of the cadets are really insurrectionist yeah, sympathizers. Right. Although that would be an interesting plot twist, I will give you that. But hell no. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Well, that pretty much wraps up our short show for the first episode of For Them to Dawn. We'll be doing these for every episode that comes out. Thank you again, guys, for listening, and tune in next week for another episode of For Them to Dawn and our analysis. Thanks for listening, guys. 